Hey, welcome. Let's take that off. Hey, see, wait, how to get on? Still going on in the background. All right, let's hope this is working. Ladies and gents, or lady or gent, or whoever you are, you can say your name if you want. If you don't want to say your name, it's perfectly fine. Uh, I mean, you can say hi as well. It's always nice to hear from fans or anyone that's just kind of like randomly popping by or anything like that. If you notice, there's a couple things different today. Uh, one is that you can see my slightly, actually, that's not slight. If you look at this side, it's a little bit. A receding hairline showing it off a little bit today. Um, for me, it was kind of a surprise back in uh, 2006 or 2007. I went to Norway for a friend's wedding and uh, my hair was all messed up. I didn't prepare and I didn't want to pay Norwegian prices for a haircut, especially coming from Canada as a student. And uh, so I, well, I brought out my trimmers and I chopped off the top. And then I realized as I had gone basically down to about like that length or whatever maybe a little bit shorter and my friend by the way i was his second best man he had two best men i think he liked the other guy a little bit better but he you know he was also kind and so he kind of like extended the best man ness to two people uh, he was like please don't do it before i shaved and i was kind of not the coolest best man i guess i shaved it turns out it was a side of me that i'd never seen before i was bald in a bit a little bit in the back a little bit up in the sides it's growing up you know, I'm 40 now, so I'm married too, got a kid, so it didn't feel so bad, but uh, it's what you want to see. Maybe it's not what you see, but there, that's all to sort of introduction, introduce this bad boy thing. You, you've seen this hat basically for a couple of months now, if you've watched my streams. Uh, if you notice, there's a bit of a garden in mud on the top here. I don't wear the hat because I'm slightly balding, uh, you know. Anyway, there's a bit of mud on the top, and that's because I've been gardening. That's no problem. Uh but this hat is finally, and this is the, you know, it's got the Fort Taco Lounge logo, drove it myself, by the way. Uh, this bad boy here is going to be, is going to be moving on. And that is because, and this is, this is one of the surprises of today. Uh, well, I got, I got a new hat in, at least I think I do. Um, I'm going to put the link in the description. There's a little bit of a problem with this thing. Uh, if you do want to support this channel, you can always go over to my spread shirt. <laughs> I don't have a way to to basically get the money into my account yet. However, if you want to, you can go here. I'll just post it right there in the comment section. You can go there. I used to have a lot of designs there. Uh, it appears that the last design that I uploaded basically backfired on me big time. And that is hopefully 
what's actually inside this box. Uh, back in my podcast days, I used to do a thing called What's in My Pocket. And I would say, what's in my pocket? And my guests would then try to guess what's in my pocket. A stupid game. There's a box here. And this here is supposed to have the hat that I designed and ordered and which basically kiboshed all my other designs. It's a very good design, I hope. At least I, uh, I put a lot of effort into it, a lot of thought into it as well. And we're just going to unbox it here. It's got an exacto knife here. Just going to slice down the middle. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was close. You got to be cool. It's, uh, looks exactly like this hat that I have on. I was kind of hoping that wasn't going to happen, but it looks like exactly the hat that I have on right here. Um, got a paper note from them. It's like, thank you for your order. Enjoy your custom products. Thank you very much for actually doing my custom product here. It is a trucker's cap. Gosh, spread your... Okay, there's like wormies and stuff all over here. Look at this stuff. It's like, look at this crap. Not supposed to be like that. But anyway, it's got a... Oh, it's got a flat brim. Yeah, let's put this bad boy on. I know that no one's actually watching right now, or at least uh, I'm just going to... Don't mind the noise. It's going on the ground. Right there. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this hat on, and you guys are going to be like, you know, I say you guys, no one's watching at the moment. Come on in here. Join the crowd. Join the stream. We're going to be putting on my hat right about right about here. Just a moment. I take off this. Take off the sticker first. Take off the sticker, and uh, it's an authentic snapback. Don't know what that is. Yupong since 1974. Never heard of that before. I don't want that on anymore. I'll peel that off. Now here, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be booty. It goes straight onto my microphone here, and uh, here we are. How do you how do you put it on if it's got like a straight back? It's kind of straight top. It's kind of really hard to. Hard to do. If my friend Dave is watching, like this is the design here. Check it out. It's um, doesn't look so bad. It's basically uh, George Floyd with uh, a Corona. <laughs> it's pretty cool. All right. Anyway, uh, got this bad boy on here. I don't know how you wear these. You're supposed to go like it hurts. You. I'm gonna bend it. I'm a 90s kid. I'm going to bend it. I found out about Beckham, by the way, in the end of the 90s. Probably just about the time that movie came, movie came out. Bend it like Beckham or whatever. So, uh, for me, if I said bend it, I always think of Beckham. And I'm not. I can't do anything else. When it comes to hats, it's got to be bent for me, you know? Well, that's too big. All right, let's put it back here. Got no one watching at the moment. If you come in, if you come in as soon as possible... If you could come in here, it would be really nice because then we can start talking about what I want to talk about, which is the Nicker 105 millimeter f2.5 portrait, as well as other lens. Oh, this hat's big. This hat's it's like I think it's an Asian hat. It's got to be an Asian hat. Like the, the top of the head is just way too. Oof, man. All right. You know what? You know what's good, Spreadshirt? You've done me a good favor. What you've done by removing this thing from your shop i don't know whether to call that censorship or not because it wasn't like i was writing anything i thought this was just a good design to capture the moment um anyway uh it's gone from my shop but gotta say if you don't have much to the top part of your head uh then this hat's a little bit big it's actually scooting all the way down in my ears it's it's not resting on the sides of my head it's resting on the top of my ears uh so there's a lot of now, it could mean that I don't have the cranial, cranial capacity that some other people do, and I wish I did, but I don't. And so, anyway, this bad boy is just going to sit down like this is my last. <laughs> it's, it's gone from Spreadshirt. So, if you don't have a big head anyway, you'll probably be thanking Spreadshirt. Thank you very much, Spreadshirt, for taking this down from my shop. Don't know why you did it, but thank you very much. It's a clap. And we got one person here, two people in here. So, now I think it's time. I don't know who you guys are. You want to say who you are? It's time to talk about one of my favorite lenses of all time. The Nicker 105mm f2.5 AIS. Got a couple of problems today. Um, by the way, when I started shooting this lens, it was back on the D200, which, uh, as you know, the D200 is an APS-C DSLR from 2005 or 2006, I believe. Uh, now, 
if you're using a 105 millimeter lens on an APS-C, of course, that's going to translate to something like 160 or 157, something like that. It's not exactly the 105 that you think it is on full frame. Of course, if you're using on a smaller sensor, it's going to be different still. If you're using a larger sensor, if it covers it, it's going to be different still. But 105, uh, anyway, I don't have the camera that I was originally shooting this lens with when I was basically using it in, uh, where was it? Sweden and uh, Japan and Korea. I do have it, however right now stuck to a Canon 5D Mark II. And why is it stuck to a Canon 5D Mark II? I'll show you. I reach down here, tennis elbow, <clears throat> mother trucker. All right, stuck to a Canon 5D Mark II. Now, why is it stuck to it? Like I said, it's because of this uh, this little shim here. It's a photo DO Canon EF to Nikker or Nikon or whatever you want to call it. Nikon F, is it F mount? Yeah. and uh, it has a focus, like a little CPU in there, so you get an actual focus confirmation through the OVF, which is really great. It fits on most of these these lenses. You cannot, unfortunately, of course, change the aperture um, for any of your, basically any of your old lenses. You have to do that manually so that the uh, screen gets darker that you're looking through. And you have to then, of course, because there's no connection uh, to the camera, you have to then separately meter and no, no, you stop down and I would suggest focusing wide open and then stopping down, but you're gonna have to then meter separately. So focus, then stop down, then meter again, and you'll get a pretty good sort of um, exposure. However, I wanted to show you the bottom of this lens, the bottom of this little shunt here, uh, but I got a problem. And that is that this lens will not release from this adapter or this adapter will not release from the camera. Now, I had this problem. I had um, in the previous live stream, I was comparing the 5D. I think it was the previous live stream. Maybe it was before. I was comparing the 5D2. You know what? There might have been something else. Anyway, I was comparing the 5D2 with the GF. Was it GFX or was it APS-C XT3? Something like that. And uh, when I did that, I had a very hard time, whilst I was making the video at least, uh, of removing this adapter from another adapter to use it then on the NovaFlex Ball Pro 2. Today, it's not that. I just can't get it off this lens. And I really don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to do. If any of you guys know what to do with a Photo Dio, Photo Dio Pro, Nick and IK to EOS adapter, please tell me. Otherwise, we're just going to look at this bad boy here, and just look at a couple of photographs that I took uh, over the years, and just talk about why I really love this lens. Now, I think uh, recently a couple of other people, um, big YouTubers, famous YouTubers, have covered this lens, and actually I had wanted to do this for a long time, and always. Someone better, someone bigger does it before I do. But the thing that is really special about this lens is also what really sucks about it right now. I got it about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, and it was something like, let's say 200 bucks US. Today, you know, if I wanted to sell it, I'd be getting like 50 for it. It's not worth much. And that doesn't matter. I mean, we have a plethora of Chinese lenses that have flooded the market. Some very high quality, some low quality, but you're getting lenses. You can buy a brand new lens from like 58 bucks. It's made out of metal. It's got glass elements, metal mount and all that. You can spend 58 bucks on a little lens like that. You can spend, you know, many thousands of dollars. So the price of the lens, as we know, doesn't really matter. And this lens is, of course, legendary. I think it was, who's that guy? He took the photograph, the, the blue-haired, um, was he Pakistani lady or Bangladeshi lady on the cover of Time magazines one of the most you know iconic images of all time i've never taken anything quite so good but let me just show you why i like this lens okay it's an ais lens already so what you're going to know about the ais lens it's got the, the aperture down here right against the body it's a single click per aperture so basically there's no half stops there's no third stops on the aperture ring you can if you want go in between just kind of instead of click from 2.5 to 4 you can just go right in between, and then you got something like 3.5, 3.2, no problem. Absolutely no problem. And it's super solid. This camera or this lens is just rock solid. The helicoid is smooth as can be. Super duper smooth. I'm hoping, by the way. Okay, looks like we shouldn't have any sound problems. Not getting any feedback from anyone here that's watching. Um, but the helicoid is super duper smooth. There's no play. So once you want to change focusing either on infinity or something closer. So here we go, infinity. And you want to change directions immediately the camera or the lens, sorry, then grips into place and you're going 
the opposite direction. There's no play at all. So there's no, when you have play in a lens, you, you're spinning and then before it goes either forward or backward, it, it, there's like this dead zone where nothing happens. You spin it and, and you don't feel any element, elements moving. But this one, it's just beautiful. Now, the, the closest focus on this thing is about a meter, as you can see right, uh, right there, which means you're not going to get super duper close to any of your subjects. However, it's a 105 millimeter lens. So whether or not you can crop in that close to a person, what you end up getting is closer than an 85, or closer than a 75, or closer than a 50 in some instances, and just works out. And f2.5, I don't know what the maths are, but you compare that to something like a, an 85 uh, 1.4, it's probably something like 2.1, 2 2.0, something like that. But gosh golly, does this lens render well? Does it lens render? Does this lens render render well? Sorry. Now, as an AIS lens, it's got. Wait, see here we are. This one has seven blades in its aperture here. Click down. Ah, I'm going. Camera. Look. Click down, and it's not. You don't see like um, a perfect circle or anything like that when you close all the way down. And certainly, from basically f four already, you're going to get some sort of aperture shape in there. So. This lens, if you're looking for absolutely smooth focus transitions from close to far or from drop off of your subject to something else, and you don't want any sort of background polygonals, you're going to want to shoot wide open. Even if you stop down just, just a little bit, right, I got lotion on, so it's right there. Yeah, you're going to see it. You're going to start to see the aperture blaze in this bad boy. However, however, I don't think that matters. And on the Canon, by the way, so the Canon 5D Mark II has a pretty good optical viewfinder, but it's not great. And of course, the aperture isn't coupled. So you have to focus or focus and then, you know, use your, your little stop down, stop down button here to check the depth of focus and all that separately from your metering, separate from everything else. So it's, it's a real bugger to use on this. And I've never used this adapter with some of like uh, Nikon's newer like P lenses or E lenses, which have an electronic aperture. So I have no idea if this will work on them anyway. At the moment, like I said, it's got this lens stuck to my camera. I can take it off, so who knows? But what this lens produces is really good. It's a lens from, I think, nine, the design is, I think, from the 60s. But the AIS version is from, like, 77 or maybe just a little bit earlier. And uh, it's good, man. It's sharp. It does have some loca or whatever you want to call it. it does have this and that. But it's... It's colors only slightly muted. There's good contrast. The texture is amazing. Flare handles pretty decently. If you're worried about that too, there's a telescoping inbuilt hood. So you don't have to worry about carrying a separate hood around you. A lot of Leica lenses have this and it's um, some Nikkor lenses of the same generation or vintage have this and it's really nice to have. It's not a strong hood that you can like then put the weight of the camera down or something like that on, but it scoops out. Um, it's flocked on the inside, so yeah, it'll pick up a bit of dust, but it's it's just good. It's just really good. I wish I could take it off this camera. Um, I've shot it with uh, three different cameras, basically. You know, with an adapter, I've actually shot it on uh, a uh, Fujifilm X-T1 and X-T3 as well. But the main camera I ever shot it or shot it on, or at least the most, was the uh, D200. And of course, the D200 I haven't used, basically, since I started my current uh, studio. Uh, it was a, I, I used it for just a couple of a couple of early on shoots, um, and then after that I went to the D D eight hundred. But I didn't really use this lens on the D eight hundred because then it was I was working at some studios and they wanted me to use autofocus and all that, so um, that was out of the picture. But I just picked it up recently um, because I was cleaning stuff out and I was like, yeah, where where did that lens go? I found it. It was where it should have been. It was in my uh, dry cabinet, and right in there, I was immediately well. <sighs> I picked up this lens and I immediately felt a connection. The, I'm, I'm 40 right now. When I started shooting, it was like 28 or something like that. I felt, I didn't feel 28 again, but I remembered immediately upon touching the barrel, the sort of images that this lens took back in Sweden and Korea. And uh, it was a bit of a nostalgia factor that went straight to my brain, straight to my heart. And uh, yeah, I, how do I say it? I just touched the lens and things came to me and so I just had to absolutely put on the, the Canon and uh, let's just look at a couple of images. 
um, from the 5D4 as well as the 5D2 and as well as some of the ones I took in Sweden. I couldn't find all of them because uh, when I did shoot this mostly in Sweden, the problem was that you have to input the, I think the, um, I can't remember on the D200. I think you can put the manual lenses that don't have any electronics. I think you can put that manually into the camera Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I had to do it separately in Lightroom. Well, I didn't do a very good job. So I just, from memory and looking at the type of images that were created and remembering that day, this is the lens I used. I'm just looking back at those, but I can't scour, let's say 3000 images and find just the 105 millimeter lenses because um, image shots, because some of them were actually mislabeled. And I was like, this is way too wide for a 105. And then, uh, but I basically whittled down the ones I was shooting back then. And uh, just some of the ones, that I've been shooting recently. And let's just take a look at that right now. I'm just gonna queue up my, um, maybe I should keep that. Oh, by the way, cheers. Not sure what you guys are drinking today. I have a couple of different stuff on my brain here. This right here is just leftover coffee from this morning. That's awful stuff. Um, and right over here, it's some diet tea. In here is a tea that's supposed to burn fat. I'm not fat, but my daughter called me the other day. She's like, Papa, you're skinny. I'm like, no, I'm not. She's like, no, 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 you're not. You're kind of fat. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm trying to get rid of the kind of um, and trying to change it from kind of fat into kind of skinny. I'm actually about five kilograms over my, my perfect body, you know, and it's time to start thinking about your perfect body. Never know what's coming up. Start to good time to run, good time to, to do some jujitsu. I've never done it. I'm just saying this stuff. I'm talking to myself, giving myself a reminder. It's time to do that anyway. Anyway, I'm going to drink this bad boy here. Ooh, that's some pretty stiff stuff. I'm not supposed to have more than 400 and mill milliliters per day. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure exactly what happens, but it could explain what's happened recently um, in a certain room of the house. Now, boys and girls, without any further ado, let's check out the photographs. We are going to... Uh, no, take that away. How do you do? stop? Share screen. All right. Application window. I think I got this right. All right. All right. I think I got this. I think I got this. I think I got this. Now let's see. Go back here. I'm not terribly good at... Uh, wait. Okay, good. Okay. We can see that stuff and we can see myself as well. Okay. So this image is taken in southern Sweden outside of a city called Vietlanda. I'm not saying it properly. You have to have a real Swede to talk about that. Um, but it was actually on the way walking from my, I'm not sure if it's notorious or not, but went to a Bible school there, um, basically where I was born. Uh, went from my Bible school, walking to Finland. It's a 11 kilometer walk. And right in the middle of it, once you get off sort of the main highway and you go straight into the countryside between the two places, it is ridiculously beautiful. So this was... Um, this was September or October, and so the sun's basically at the middle of the day. Don't go very high. The sun's always going at this, my wife called it a fairyland sort of angle, meaning that, let's see, I think I can go full screen on this bad boy. I think I can, but maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Full screen. All right. Um, anyway, this basically the sun rays, they come at a pretty acute angle even in the middle of the day. So you, you don't get any of this direct, harsh sunlight that makes the shadows turn into like really sharp, crisp lines. No, everything's soft. The colors are, I mean, this lens does give some co some muted colors, but I haven't really changed anything. The only thing that was changed for any of these images really was uh, white balance, except for some images I took last week with my daughter. But um, yeah, there were some like ponies in there and there's a, a lazy river up there. You can do some canoeing. And of course, Sweden, uh, Norway, I believe, is the same thing. No Denmark, I'm not exactly sure, is quite famous for a, um, a sort of law where you can basically walk through anywhere you want in the country. There is private property that you cannot go through, but in the country, at least, you can walk through places. If someone owns a land, you can ask them, may I walk through your land? Or, I mean, you have the right to do it, but, you know, it's nice to ask for it. And even if you want, you can camp on their land with their permission, basically anywhere. And uh, it's the whole... The cities are, are kind of not as nice as they used to be um, for a, a variety of reasons, but the countryside is redonkulously beautiful. Um, and anyway, we're using this is a D two hundred shot. So if we go in, we're not gonna we're not gonna get a lot of pixels here and there just because there's not a lot of pixels to go around in the D two hundred. And of course, we're gonna have all the the IQ problems of the D two hundred. But I don't know, man. 
even with that, with those those problems, the CCD sensor on that thing and this lens put together for a combination of like 160 millimeter lens, roughly, just just blows me away. I think I was stopped down probably f5 5.6. Have no idea what it was, but just <clears throat> I love it. Let's go back here a second here. All right, I'm gonna go down. This is okay. Not a great shot. Not great colors. Probably this was like some messed up JPEG from like uh, one of those iPad apps back in the day. Um, so not, not, you know, I'm not terribly happy with this image, but there's one thing to just notice, just how the, the images sort of fall off from sharp or kind of sharp. I wasn't exactly in focus. This is a manual focus lens. The D200 focus screen is not that great for this sort of thing, um, but it's roughly in focus. The, uh, the fall off is very nice on this lens. Now, what I took last week um, of my daughter, this was with the 5D4. It was a sun, not sunny day outside. It was a, let's see here. It was a cloudy day. Um, how do I, what, how do you, what? Just a moment, guys. All right, view, enter full screen. All right, um, cloudy, uh, but you can tell just, just the softness of the focus fall off. And you'll notice also, despite this being an ancient lens, you're not going to get, there's not a lot of swirl. You're not getting a lot of compression out to the sides. There is a little bit, if we scoot in here, from, you can see that the um, bouquet is a little bit flat pressed here instead of round, but it's it's minimal. And it it's, it's separate from being just a sort of classic draw, just really nice. Um, my daughter was just looking up. This is a street where I live on. In the spring, this is all pink. These are all sakura trees or cherry blossoms, very beautiful. Uh, I mean, the colors of this lens are just, you know, phenomenal. And with the 5D4, it's uh, pretty easy to nail focus. Now, if you'll notice, I didn't exactly nail it. I don't have the best eyes, whatever, but uh, it's good enough. If, if you're doing like family photography, if you're doing photography for other people, which is, you want to capture the moment. Now, everything, if it can be perfectly sharp, great. It doesn't have to be. Not, I've never, ever had anyone apart from my advertising business that's like, we want everything perfectly sharp. It's more important to have the image. And anyway, this, Im this lens, as long as you can capture the image, just beautiful, just beautiful how it draws. I'm just going to check over here and say, in case if we have any uh, sharing window. Okay, good. I <laughs> just want to make sure we're still going. All right. Now, this was also on the way back from a hike back in Sweden. Coming back, there was just this little tricycle in the middle of a yard coming down from a big hill. I haven't done anything this image. I th there might be a white balance change. I'm not exactly sure. Um, as you can tell, it's actually even straight from the NEF. These are all basically NEF files that I exported to JPEGs um, without any uh, touching except for the ones with my daughter. Um, but yeah, it's it's sharp. The colors are like really vibrant. Uh, where did I try to focus on this thing? When I say sharp, I mean, we're looking at D200 here. So, I mean, it's, it's sharpish. There's a, in here, you can see some like locale here, just a little bit on this this little uh, vertical, what is this, like grommet or whatever. But uh, yeah, it's it's just a good looking lens. Good looking, look, the focus. You know, you with F2.5, you don't get too shallow of focus. You get the things that you need roughly in focus um, and if you want to get a full face in focus and if you're from like maximum or minimum focus distance you're going to have to stop way down but if you're if you're back enough far enough that you can get a trike that's like you know 0 0.75 meters wide or maybe it's even a little bit longer than that and you can put almost two in the frame basically a, shooting it down at like f4 or f5.6 is going to reveal quite a bit of depth of focus um and yeah i think it's, it's got even stop down, just got some good character. And this was just from last week. This is not Sweden, this is now Japan. Taking a picture of my daughter's croc. That was a 5D4, so there's quite a bit more pixel information here. You can scoot way in. And you'll notice that despite there being 30 megapixels, this camera, or this lens, sorry, um, even shot wide open, is returning really, really sharp uh, images. Really, really sharp. So it's really great. Um, as you notice, even with this busy background, it doesn't go swirly in a weird way. There's basically no sort of, none of that classic sort of dizziness. There's not too much shading. It's just, I don't know, on digital, it actually, on digital, it actually looks, it might look better than it does on film. And there's very few lenses that I like, or at least that I think 
uh, look as good on film as on film. Sorry. Let's go down here. Now, if anyone wants to say anything, I know there's only three people watching. Come on in, guys. Come on in. If uh, if anyone wants to say something, please do say something. Gain, it's my daughter. I'm a dad. What does a dad take? You know, what are the images a dad takes? Well, before he's married, before he has a girlfriend, he's taken images of objects. Men take images of objects. Straight lines, windows, shadows. They, they do kind of like kind of edgy street photography. They don't do soft images. They don't. Once they become a dad... It's kind of sound weird. I think their estrogen levels go up, and then suddenly they they just taken people photographs all the time. You know, before before their daughter came along or the son came along, take a picture of their wife. You know, she's the most important person in your life. And when you get kids, she still is. But suddenly, the sort of memories that you're wanting to create are the sort of memories that you're hoping to leave for your daughter or your son as well. And then you just basically start taking pictures of your daughter or son. So this is last week. Daughter's four at the top of a slide. Um, did I nail the focus? Not exactly nail it, but it's good enough. It's all taking it like I think ISO 1600. So there's a bit of noise. Looks great. It's a 5D4, freaking amazing camera. Wide open, so you can tell it's just all balls, bubbly balls out there for the bokeh. Um, there's no viney textures in anything that's out of focus. It's just slight. It's just blurred in a very nice way. A little bit of swirl. If you'll, whoop, hey, 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 come back here. Little bit of swirl, little bit of swirl just right down here. Um, but the colors are vibrant, just uh, it's great. You know, the Nikon C the Nikon D200 CCD is a great sensor, really good colors, a little bit of a pastelish as well as high contrast sort of color in there. But the 5D4 being a CMOS sensor, I think I don't know if it's just something about Canon colors themselves or whatever, but it's kind of like it's kind of like the Canon 5D4 is like gripping on to the days of the CCD, but pulling them forward into the benefits of the CMOS sensor era where you get lower noise, et cetera. And you can actually recover highlights pretty well on it. Um, not, yeah, I don't know. Um, of a full frame sensor so far, 5D4, sure, it doesn't, you can't do the the blacks. You can't bring them up as far. You can't do high ISO with, with as low noise as you can on some of the cameras. But in the general range from like ISO 100 to 6. 1400 I'm not sure I've, I've used a full frame sensor that I like quite as much okay again it's my daughter I'm a dad remember look she's got her her feet are going into the shoes eventually I probably scolding her Lily you're gonna step on another dog poo why don't you put on your shoes and she's like my daddy anyway you can see there's a little bit of vinous here of course these are big nasty pieces of grass it shouldn't be growing out like that but they only cut this grass like a couple times a year um a little bit of vineyards. So if you like that sort of thing, and I do, then it's going to add character in a sort of classic way to your photographs. In fact, it's a sort of character that really got me into the Canon 35 LTM, which I did review on this channel earlier on. Check it out. It's not in the description, but just look at my channel videos. Really great lens. That sort of vineyards, I love, you know, that's completely idiosyncratic. So you might not, but anyway, this one doesn't go overboard. The Canon would do the vininess with a hard sort of color texture in the middle. So the vines really stuck out and drew your attention. This one is muted and I think overall just great. Now, I don't know where this came from. I took this last week. We have a blossom. It looks to me like a cherry blossom, but the leaves are not cherry. So maybe it's a plum or peach, not sure. And it's, uh, it's September. So maybe there's such a thing as a a September blooming peach or plum blossom. Uh, if there is, this is it. Um, I didn't get the focus perfect, but I did okay. Um, going into, I don't know, 300, 400% here. But just look at that focus fall off. It is. Mm. Look at it. And the you know, outside darkens a little bit, but not much. If you get it far, if you get the subject far enough from a dark area, it just kind of like slowly, gently blends into the background. It's just... It's so good. And double edges, a little bit of double edges down here, but that actually could be a, another twig behind it. I don't know. It's uh, it's just a really great looking, really great, really great looking lens here. Let's see. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Some people are chat chatting. Mark H. What's up, dude? <laughs> I uh, should be looking at the chat. I never look at the chat. What's up, dude? Mark H. It's good to see you again. CCD rules. Yes, it does. Um, CCD, the only... Uh, 
Sorry, am I here in my air conditioner? No, they're taking a shower. All right. So CCD is amazing. The thing I don't like about it, again, is um, just if you want to bump up the ISO, even on a large sensor like um, like the Hasselblad CFV50 that I used to have as a CCD, amazing colors, bitingly sharp, big pixels. Uh, but if you, if you bumped up the ISO beyond ISO 200, it was like, yeesh. It looked like a, a modern camera, like ISO 300 or 3200, something like that. It's really bad. And most CCD cameras were like that. Uh, maybe not to that extent, but gosh, their colors are good. And the 5D4, no, I don't think the colors are quite as good as the Nikon D200. In terms of, I think the overall Canon color science, I like the way the colors show up, but how they're blended, how they show through the contrast and all that, I think the CCD is better. But noise, and I don't know. It's the five. The five D four is blowing my brain. That's all I want to say here. You love your, yeah, yeah. There we are. Um, M nine, yeah, Mark H M nine in good light. But you know what? The the M nine actually does really good up to ISO uh, sixteen hundred. Actually, I was actually really impressed with it. So you know, if you can take sixteen hundred down to pretty bad light, depending on your hand holding, depending on how much you want to stop things as well. So I think uh, they're really great, um, Victor. Good to see you again. And Anna, Victor and Anna, you have the same surname. I assume that you guys are, or I don't know how you do the sign for marriage or whatever, or brothers, sisters, I mean. I don't know. Uh, maybe, Victor, are you are you going to propose on this channel? No? Well, whatever. If it's your sister, then it's just cool to have family. If it's not, nice. All right. I'm glad that we got a family vibe on family vibe on family vibe on the family vibe on this show, family vibe on this show. All right, let's go back to another photograph. Oh, we're back here. Just hit down again. I'm a father. I take pictures of my daughter <laughs> to the detriment of the relationship with my wife. I've got to take more pictures of her. She's looking better than ever. Actually, interestingly, um, my wife was cute in her twenties. When in her thirties, I'm not trying to not trying to give anything away here. The woman comes out, and the woman I like. I, the girl was cute. The woman is is the woman. The woman. There's something. It's nice. I like getting old with my wife. Just not old, <laughs> maturing with my wife. Uh, it's I like I like my wife. I love my wife, and I like the woman that's coming out. Anyway, this is my daughter here. I uh, shot behind a bit of grass. Grass was parted like this. I didn't part it myself. So I, I left nature as it was after I trampled it, of course, coming through. But the, we were playing a game called Hide and Seek. You probably heard about it. And uh, she found me, obviously. But, you know, I barely nailed the focus, I think. Nah, not quite. I was going through grass. It's a little bit soft. But look at this this lens. Just, mm. You know, in our circles, I um, someone recently, I think it was a Fuji, Fuji X form or whatever it was called, the Fuji Rumors, uh, they were talking about the recent uh, D preview review of the 51.0, and they're like, too many people in our, we're at D preview, especially and at YouTube and their website. Too people, too many people talk about just the gear. They don't talk about the photographs. They don't show their photographs. And you know what? I agree with that, but at the same time, I think D preview is a gear website. It's not like Fred Miranda where you go on and you're talking, you're talking your technique and you're talking the artistic element of it. It's, it is a gas website. It exists for gas. It's done. It's connected with, with Amazon. It exists to sell or help sell products and get some sort of commission in return, something like that. So I don't mind that people are coming on and they're like, you know, in FF terms, this is what actually be like an F1.5 and it would be way more expensive than an actual 75 1.5 and it's got all these problems with it not you know all of that feedback is fine it's perfectly fine it's at d preview whatever but interestingly enough on fuji rumors someone was talking about it i think his name is Stu dash c and he's like he called them he called them a word that i never thought i would hear on a camera forum because it's a word i've only seen on twitter and it only in the context of some sort of horrible political discussion he called the guys that are complaining about the lens he's like they're gammon i was like 
there's another word the gammon i think kind of if you use the word gammon you're probably on the left if you word if you use the word npc you're probably on the right but i or N -O npc yeah non-player non-playable character yeah you're probably on the right but i never would want to see the word gammon or npc put into the context of a lens review or a camera review you know sometimes we just want to talk about sometimes we do want to talk about the gear you know and I led into this thing, and I think I've taken some decent photographs. I'm not the best photographer out there for sort of people and all that, um, but I do have an eye. Um, certainly not the best one out there. But there's something about talking about the gear. There's some things, if you're a photographer, either you're getting paid for it or not getting paid for it, but you you know you use photography is a big part of your life. The gear that you use is going to have maybe well, it's not going to have a material connection to your heart or soul because you can't plant the camera in there, but there's this material element of the lens that you're going to somehow get into or not get into. There are some lenses I really, really liked the rendering of, but I hated the mechanics of. One was the Feuchtlanda 51.8 SL2 for Nikon. The mechanics were poor. The aperture blades is always, when you stop down, they kind of went wonky on one side and they were round on the other side. Um, there, They also when you change the aperture, there was a little bit of play in the aperture. It bumped over places where it shouldn't have. It wasn't tight. The focus ring was fine, but it was it was just like two steps that were off where the Nikon camera or the Nikon lens, sorry, that competed with it or that cl most closely competed with it basically was perfect in every way. So there's, and there's a whole bunch, there's a whole bunch of lens. One, one of my favorite lenses of all time for rendering is the Leica Elmarit 28. 2.8 for Leica M. Uh, it's a digital uh, with the. It's got the digital codec coding on it. Came out after the M9, I think. That lens is sharp. Has really good bokeh despite the fact that it's a 2.8 at um, 28 millimeters. But its mechanics aren't the great greatest. The aperture ring feels fine. Putting on the camera is a little bit tough because it's a tiny little body and there's not much to grip that doesn't move. And the focus ring has a bit of play. So you want to change the directions and suddenly right when you're changing directions because there's that slight delay you're kind of missing the effect of if there's a delay in the focus it doesn't feel good now if it's an autofocus lens every autofocus not a single autofocus lens i should say that i've ever used has good manual focus compared to a fully manual focus lens there's probably a million reasons for it but you can you can understand that an autofocus lens fine it's got motors. It's trying to approximate the feel of, of some sort of like helicoid, which it's not actually sitting on, yada, yada, yada. So whatever. But when it comes to an actual helicoid lens, it has to be absolutely hermetic. That is no play. If there's play, it just feels wrong. Another lens that I really liked is the uh, Nikon 35-2. That one had a bit of play and it was light. It wasn't, the aperture ring wasn't quite as precise. Also, the 50 F2 was a little bit like that. And the 50 F2 is one of the best 50s I've ever used, but I didn't like using it. I liked the images that came out of it. Now, let's just go over here to the chat, see if anyone's here. Because of marriage. Hey, there we are. Victor and the Anna, I'm glad you. <laughs> it's a family show. It's a family show. Congrats. And uh, Victor, I, I assume that you, I have no idea how old, how old you guys are, but I assume that you're going to enjoy when they, you know, on those, like those lovey-dovey shows, those like romance movies are like, I want to grow old with you. The, it, fine. Yeah. We understand it. The words we understand, but when it happens, it's like, my parents called it just a moment. Got to cry here a second here. I bet you anything, my daughter just kicked water onto the wood floor and that's what's happened. So she's in trouble. My, my wife's like, okay, it's like the 700th time. We don't do that. You got to wipe it. And she's like, I don't want to wipe it. I'm go eat something down there. And she's like, nope, got to wipe it first. Um, yeah, but there's, you know, in your head, because you've seen it in movies all the time and people just kind of, rat, they say it all the time. You're like, I want to grow old with you. It's, it's something. <laughs> Sorry, I'm distracted here. It's something that, you hear so often, you say so often, it's trite, has no meaning anymore. But when it happens to you, and all you can say is, I want to grow old with you, or I love growing old with you, it means something to you. And I have no idea how to say it, but it's true. And we're off topic, so let's go. Wait, we got one question from Mark, or a comment from Mark, and then we're going to go back to photographs. 
by the way, thank you guys very much for sitting here and listen to a guy talking about one of his favorite lines. It's just showing images of his family and other stuff. It's uh, it's very interesting. Uh, Mark H says, I just bought a planner 110 F2. Unfortunately, the aperture blades are stuck at wide open. That would be the Hasselblad lens, I believe, right? For the H system. I think I'm right. Although I think they they made one. Oh, they made one also for the um, for the V system as well. Yeah. So they're stuck wide open. If it's, um, you know, actually, I'll be doing a video a little bit later on of actually fixing a lens whose aperture blades are stuck wide open. It's an electronic lens. It's a Canon 24 to 70. I have two of them. Uh, the first version, they're very good lenses. Um, the first version is not that sharp, but it's very good rendering style. The second version is much sharper. I don't like the rendering styles quite as much for the V system, okay? Um, but I'll be doing a video later on. Um, hopefully no words, just me just kind of fixing one of those lenses with an aperture unit. Um, you probably could do that yourself, um, especially if, because that's a fully mechanical system. However, the fully mechanical systems are a little bit tricky as regards the aperture parts. So uh, anyway, let's go back to the photographs. Mark, thank you very much. Boom. All right, next photograph. Again, it's my daughter's running away, it's hide and seek. Why is this a cool photograph? I don't know. Uh, but, okay, why is it a good demonstration of what this lens can do? It's not. None of these are, really. Um, you can zoom in. You can, you can get sharp. It's using 30 megapixels. This lens was designed 50 years ago, and it can still return really sharp results. Look at, okay. That's just ugly weeds, basically weeds here that you see where the cursor is doing, and then weeds in the foreground. They're just grass seed or going to seed here. Um, some ugly weeds down there. But the way that they go out of focus here, again, with the, sometimes it looks like a double line. It could just be that there's two pieces of grass that are tilted at the same place. And the far end, where it goes viney, it's very, um, it's a soft sort of viney. The way things fall out of focus, now check this out. This here is a foreground bouquet. I think that this is one of the best foreground bouquets I've ever seen. It doesn't go to weird shapes. It doesn't clump. Some lenses clump. And so what you get is something really distracting. Now, maybe there are lenses that do a better job of doing foreground bouquet um, whilst the subject is more in the background. I don't know. Um, the other thing I like about this lens, this photograph well, it's just the fact that my daughter's, it, she's enjoying, it's obvious, okay. Is she enjoying a game? Is there a story here? I don't know, but it's, it's just, she's being a kid and she's just enjoying being a kid. Um, is it sharp enough as Peppa Pig or Peppa Pig degenerate <laughs> on her shirt here? Uh, it's the manual focus lens, she's running. I barely caught up to her. Anyway, I, I don't see any, I don't see a photograph apart from just bad, bad technique on my part or just bad eye i don't see a photograph this lens does it's just horrible we'll look at a couple ones that are stopped down a little bit later on um again it's my daughter you know just on a swing check that out she fell got a little bit of dirt there <laughs> nice nice got a little bit more dirt or is that could be marker as well it looks like she got some cuts anyway anyway this is the the kind of nasty little park near our house looks like something from the soviet era <laughs> from actual like soviet russia it's all like rusted away. It's probably like a safety hazard. But anyway, it just looks, it, this park doesn't look good, but the bouquet is just freaking amazing on this lens. Just, I would I would have a debate with somebody <laughs> about the quality. If they're like, this lens sucks, I'd be like, no. Put your money where your mouth is. Um, next, okay, fine. It's just my daughter again. But you know, just being a kid. When she gets old, she's going to have a book of just being a kid. And uh, here you see in the in the foreground, the bouquet is a little bit busy, but this is grass. I don't think you can get any better than this in terms of making a, a busy foreground element soft. Fine, right? Again, is my daughter, but don't worry. It's the last one for a little bit while. We're leaving the park. She's actually waiting for friends. Um, yeah. By the way, uh, this is in the middle of the thing that's going on, and no one in my area wears anything like that. Um, it's nice. It just It just feels natural feels like there's still a world out there that's that's like the world as it should be. Anyway, here we're back to Japan. Uh, another time in Japan here. I'm focusing on something very close to me, which is this ugly thistle, basically. I'm not sure this is a great image, uh, but this is back with the D200 some years ago. And this is wide open. 
it looks pretty busy here actually, to be very honest, but stop down a bit and then focus on the ladder itself. And here we get quite a bit. You can see, you know, again, this is a 10 megapixel sensor. It's only using a central portion of the lens. So you're not going to get a lot of focus fall off, et cetera. But uh, you can definitely see that at like 5.6 or whatever this is, you can get an entire, you know, 10 centimeter thick pole basically right in focus, at least from down here. And it looks like pretty far up. So, I mean, we're talking about depth of focus, probably like, I don't remember what f-stop I, I took it at, but uh, it's pretty good. Anyway, that's basically wide open, focusing close and stop down, focusing a little bit farther away. It's not really a inspiring image, but it is what it is. Down, back to Sweden here. Um, again, this is right, right before the fall really starts to kick in a couple, three ducks, little nice little house down there. I don't know if that's a boat house. I don't know if it's a pump house, whatever it is. It's some sort of reservoir here. There's a mill right to the right of it. It's just, I don't know, three ducks, three ducks. Let this inspire you. I miss focus, by the way, check it out. I think I actually focused on the water here. Again, the D200 focus screen is not very good. Um, there'd be a whole bunch of things. Whilst I was using, using a D200, what really miffed me about it most was that the focus screen was so small, as well as it wasn't terribly bright and it was hard to focus. A little bit harder than, cer certainly compared to full frame camera, we've got a big one. And some of them, like, like SL, the original SL2 from the 60s, that thing is massive, and you can focus very easily on on anything using any lens. Um, but the D two hundred was very difficult. Uh, how do we go down here? There we are. Same park. By the way, check out the type of grass here in Sweden. It's kind of like long, almost like spindly needles that are just coming out of the ground here. Very sharp, as you can tell with this lens. Um, the D two hundred clipped the shot, the uh, highlights a bit here obviously, and I missed focus on the cat, but I just got something there. If you just want to talk about the sort of images this lens takes. Again, foreground here, it's grass, but it looks good. The colors are straight out of camera. CCD, Mark H, CCD. All right, let's see if there's anything uh, in the chat here. Love the shots. Okay, cool. Okay, well, cool. I'm glad you guys like the shots. That's really cool. We'll go back here. Back to Sweden again. It's the one of the the same area that I started out this home uh, image set in. Um, now there's two different horses. Now I'm not showing the the river here, um, but I don't know how many horses there was. Something five, six, something like that. But again, the light just fallen right at that sort of acute angle where the sun is probably just above the far trees and just coming down. Maybe maybe coming through the trees, just soft. Um, here you're going to see some problems with the D200. I think this is probably even like ISO 200, something like that. But uh, uh, maybe because of the out of focus, you can't really tell. But there's definitely some noise right here in the shadows. Uh, it's not terribly obvious, maybe in the JPEG, but in the NAF file, it was it was definitely it was definitely evident. Um, and I think this was stopped down just a tiny little bit. Anyway, just I don't know that southern Sweden is beautiful. And uh, one thing in my life, uh, I find interesting. I was only, you know, I was basically, I was born in Sweden, uh, spent just a few years there, um, went back a bunch of times as a kid, or not a bunch, but went back as a kid, used to speak kid Swedish, um, basically forgot it. But it's not like I was there long enough to really call it home, obviously, and I'm only one quarter Swedish. Uh, so it's not my, it's not really my blood. It's the biggest portion of my mutton blood. Um, but every time I find a place that reminds me of Southern Sweden, I immediately feel something in my heart. And the, so that's just kind of an interesting aside for this image stream here. And there are a couple of places I've seen it in Hokkaido in Northern Japan. There are some places like Southern Sweden, as well as uh, Eastern Canada is a little bit like it as well. And uh, yeah, I go there and suddenly I'm like, where am I? It feels like home. Again, same place, but this time we have foreground river and background river, lazy rivers there for canoeing, some nice birch trees here, just showing the quality of light. Doesn't really show you what this lens can do because I'm pretty stopped down, probably F8, F11 here. And with APS, you're, you're looking at like 20, 22 or something like that. So, oh, went back to my daughter in the FD4 or the 5D4. Strider, by the way, is not an advert here, but uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, sharp, sharp lens. If you actually get it 
perfectly in focus. It's almost as sharp as a, as a modern prime. Uh, the Zeiss 100 millimeter F2 that you can get in Milvis as well as classic um, Canon and Nikon designs is sharper, definitely sharper. And the contrast is more punchy and it's F2 rather than F, um, F2.5. And because of that, you get, I mean, it's a really great lens, but it's also like 300 extra grams and it, it's a lot of money. Um, people have put them back to back. I don't know if I'll do that for some sort of comparison. If I had to sell one and just keep one, I would probably keep the Nikon just because it's smaller, it's easier. I don't... Spending that much money on um, a manual lens, especially in current year, is a little bit... It's a little bit tricksy. And uh, as well, the Nikon, if you bump it or scratch it, you know, the lens is worth nothing anyway at the moment. But the, the Zeiss, I found that for some reason, the Zeiss lens is you brand new, say 1600 bucks, you can sell the next day and it's like a thousand. <laughs> if you have a scratch on it, you like you take 200 bucks off of that. So again, same place, but it's a white horse. Look at that. And there's a beam of the, the tree on the right-hand side going down like an elbow. And right in there and between it and the, um, the roots at the bottom there, the horse is bending down. I think there's like a bit of symmetry there that I like. And uh, I must have caught something in flare here a little bit. I probably was not using the inbuilt hood. And so this shows uh, a bit of flare. I think that this is either right here where the cursor is. This is either some sort of flare or it's just a lower contrast because the sun is coming at some sort of obtuse angle and hitting the sensor. But uh, yeah, you know what? That's just the colors of the leaves. But overall, you can see that there's... Oops, sorry about that. Hey, go back down. Overall, you can see that there is a bit of haze um, just from the sun coming in obtusely. Anyway, I think it looks... Also, if you look in the leaves here, I don't know, locale doesn't look so bad. Now, once you start talking about locale, then someone's going to be like, you're a gammon. But uh, I'm all right with that. I'm also taking images. And this is back in Japan. One thing a lot of foreigners do when they come to Japan, and I'm still amazed at it, is you look up in some of these older parts of the city and you're like, what is that? It's like spiders have descended all over the city and they've woven or weaved, weaved, I think is the word. They've weaved their webs everywhere above. Sometimes it connects into a trolley system, but it's usually just power lines going from this to that. Now, are the power lines up there because there's earthquakes and it's easier to repair because they break? We've had power lines break in this area three or four times. Or are they there because it's harder after the fact to put them underneath the ground. I don't know, but they're everywhere. And so like a typical foreigner, I took pictures. This is back somewhere in Kyoto. I took pictures of the power lines. <laughs> this is what the power lines look like at like F4 on a Nikon D200, right? Uh, I eat your heart out, Shilob. Let's go down here. Oh, and there's my daughter just doing like Superman pose or whatever in the middle of the street. Um, should have corrected the horizon. Didn't do that. This was just exported straight, basically straight from camera. Um, I think with a tweak to white balance. Not sure. Anyway, bokeh is amazing. Amazing. We're going to see a little bit more actually beautiful color bokeh quite soon. Uh, March, sorry, not soon. It's about four or five months from now. But in March, all of this gray in the background that you see now is all pink for about two weeks or week and a half, two weeks. Um, again, they're all Sakura. So we're going to look at some beautiful stuff a little bit later. Uh, so in five months, if I'm still doing the live stream thing, please stick around. Hope to show you some cool stuff then. Let's see. Do I have any more photographs? And again, I'm a dad. So I'm taking my picture of my daughter. She wanted to climb up the, the um, what is this thing, slide. And I thought it looked really cute. And she finally actually did uh, cooperate and smile. A lot of times she's doing like a funny face with Superman pose. Being a kid, enjoying being a kid. Anyway. Came away. <laughs> Here's the kid bit here. Look at that. Right there. It's You know what? That's not dirt. I think she's that's a marker. She's been drawn on herself. She's been drawn on her floor too, by the way. And you know what? I don't think I have any more images. I think that's all I have in this queue. Back. All right. Here we are. Back to the stream. All right. Um, let's see. Love that. Thank you guys. Yeah, you said super nice shots. Thank you very much for that. Did you use this lens on the GFX as well? You know, I did put it on the GFX. Um... With that, ad was it with that adapter or was it with another adapter? But I never really took it. I just wanted to see kind of how sharp it was generally. And so I just twisted the focus into place um, with the lens off 
the lens cap off, obviously, and just to see how sharp it looked in the center. And it looked great, um, but it didn't cover the full center, of course. Uh, but yeah, it looked. I mean, it's a great lens, you know. Um, if you're if you're wondering like how shallow the depth of focus will be if you use on a GFX, obviously it's going to be a little, you know, twenty percent, like literally twenty percent shallower because. What is the mathematics for the GFX? It's a 1.6. Uh, the sensor size is one or 60% larger than full frame. And it gives, a, what is it? It gives 80, just a moment here. 80% of whatever a full frame lens is, it gives something like that. So a 110 would be like an 85. 100 would be like 80. So if you got a 2.5, take away 20% of that, 2.5, 2.5. So basically, yeah, you'd have two, F2 at like 83. That's all right, but it wouldn't cover the entire sensor. Now, if I got that right, I don't ever, I'm messing something up here. It's, it's too much information coming to me all at once. You're trying to, Mark, you're, you're sniping me there, man. All right. Uh, that's like I don't have anything else for the stream. I just wanted to show some images, images about this lens, um, just because I'm just trying to clean up a couple of things. I um, in the next month or so, I'm going to be renting the 24 to 72 for the Canon, the EF lens um, version two. I'm going to be comparing it to the first one, but not not in a way that's like technical. You already have that. You can go to Deep Reviewed and see that. You can go to other better better reviewers. Um, but I just want to sort of show how it stands up to its quote unquote equivalent on the XT3. And that will be, and then I'll do the same thing with the 50 to 140. And then I will be selling the XT3. And I'll be going just basically DSLR for a while. Who knows how long? Um, and the basic reason is uh, I, the battery life's better. In the, in the full frame and uh, I can use older cheaper cheaper lenses um, overall I think the investment by getting a 5d4 a used one versus something like an xt4 or even an xt3 um, in the long run is probably better for someone that isn't actually doesn't really want to go forward in the sort of vein that he was in photography before I do want to sort of stop Maybe maybe just keep doing the magazines, but not doing any sort of advertising photography anymore, um, and then just move into family photography. So I don't really need need is a bad word. The five D four would have done me way better than the XT three, um, and probably if I were smart, to be very honest, as much as I love the SL, um, probably would have just done better to go with the five D four from the very start. So uh, yeah. So that's just kind of me saying that I'll be getting rid of the X-T3 sometime in the next month, month and a half. Of course, by then, the X-T3 will have lost something like another 40% off its price. Man, it I got it at what was a pretty good price like one and a half year ago. Um, came with an extra like small grip that you buy. I think it came with a grip. It came with 11 batteries, which is good. Five of them or six of them are actual Fujifilm ones. came with... Um, a cage, yeah, it came with a cage. That's what it is. It came with a cage. It came with the eighteen to fifty-five that kit, and I got it for at the time equivalent of like fifteen hundred bucks, something like that. All of it told, um, it had a little, a couple of scratches. It's in good shape, um, and I haven't put any more scratches on it. But I've watched the prices of the body just, just dive bomb, just totally dive bomb. My GFX. That thing dive bombed as well. It's still selling in Japan for like seven grand, um, but mine, which was beautiful and perfect, perfect shape, didn't even sell for half of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's the other thing about people complain. They're like, why would why would you you don't you don't buy a camera to be able to sell it at the price you you bought it years later. That's not why you buy it. You buy it to use it. So why are you complaining about the used prices? If you have other camera systems that don't plummet in price in the same amount of time or plummet in the same, they plummet by the same amount over a longer period of time, then you have some sort of comparison mechanism <laughs> to basically get you to rethink your investment in a system. And I think it was with Mark, maybe last time I was on, he's like, you know, Leica do hold their value better. And they do. Um, I found that the Leica is basically... 
as l- if you compare them against American prices, they hold their prices really well, even several, three, four years later. If you get on the Japanese market, the problem is like what you buy for six grand in the States, you buy for like eight grand or nine grand here. And so the problem is a lot of Japanese people, they're like, forget, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend three extra grand on this bloody thing. So they import. And so most of the units that you'll find used, or a lot of them will then, they're competing, even if they're gray imports, they're competing with cameras that are way more expensive. And there's like, as far as I can tell, there's no reason for them to be way more expensive. So that is a problem in the Japanese market. Um, but overall, I found yeah, they as long as you as long as you have a benchmark, basically, okay, so the U.S. price is this. They they keep their price very very well, even in Japan, uh, even against the Japanese prices overall. Um, but you know, Japan is a little bit kind of kind of tr- troublesome. Yeah, but yeah, I, like I said in the last one, uh, X Pro One, I bought a year after it was debuted, brand new from a shop, not from a person, for about half the price. It was eight hundred. Be by eight hundred bucks is what I bought it for um, in Japan, and then I sold it. Of course, I got like half of that gain for it. It's like, geez, um, XH1. I got you know XH1. We all know the thing about XH1. In like less than a year, it went down what half, half roughly in the in the abroad, and the XT3 seems to be doing the same, almost the same thing. And it's just uh, after a while, it's um, it's a little bit debilitating, to be very honest. Um, the lenses seem to hold value pretty well. I'm very happy with that. I buy all my lenses used for uh, for Fujifilm. Um, like, a, did I? I bought all my lenses used, I think. Um, and lenses, of course, as we know, basically, as long as you're you're getting to a system that's not being dropped or something like that, they hold their value pretty well. Um, and I think with some like has actually made some money back, uh, which is pretty cool. But yeah. I'm going to complain about it because the truth is that Fuji films don't hold their value and fine. Yeah. The Fuji films were used to make me a little bit of money uh, here and there, but because I'm using some other systems that don't brought that don't drop in price as much, it's a real bugger to sort of go back and forth between them and the Fuji film. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mark Cage like Japan prices are insanely or insane, especially for like a Hasselblad stuff, basically anything foreign. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, I don't really have a problem with that necessarily. Um, I think protectionism is is perfectly uh, fine, but I think in the case of like and Hasselblad, I don't think they have to do any protectionism because those sit on a, a price tier that's above consumer prices anyway. So it's not like people are going to be like, do I choose my Leica or do you choose my Canon? Because the Leica, even if you get the foreign price, it's going to be double the price of Canon. So I'm not sure why it is. It could be just it's a prestige item. Um, interestingly though, some House of Blood stuff is actually not so expensive here and the dealers are very good for House of Blood. Um, I was working when I was shooting House of Blood, I, uh, used, it was called national photo and they're right in that, that place where people dress up and they, and they, they dress up like dolls and like weird 1800s, like, I don't want to say fetish stuff. But it's kind of like a fetish, uh, no, no, not Kamakura. It's, um, Harajuku, Harajuku. Yeah, right there. There's a place called National Photo tucked away in the middle of like some corner back back alley somewhere. There's a really great photo place. Um, they do rentals. They they sell a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I bought a whole bunch of my stuff from there. It's really great. But um, yeah, they, the Hasselblad prices were not so bad there. And I, yeah, I got a really good deal on the CFV 50C when I bought it. Came in a big uh, crate. It came with a body, a crate, and an 80 millimeter lens, like the big wood crate. And inside was the House of Blood box there. Uh, and the crate, they're like, do you want us to ship it in the crate? And I'm like, does it come with the House of Blood? They're like, yes. It's like, does it cost extra? And they're like, we'll cover the cost. So they shipped it. And I was expecting a crate, but it, it's like a big, it's a crate almost the size of a pallet um, or two thirds the size of the pallet, except maybe, I don't know, like 600, 600 millimeters tall or something like that. And so I ended up like, what do you do? What do you use that for? I painted it, <laughs> eventually painted it uh, with some waterproofing stuff. And for a while, it became my compost until until it was obvious I didn't do a very good job. And uh, the water got a little bit inside the bottom. So that thing basically is now compost itself in my backyard. So, yeah. Anything else, ladies and gents? Mark, you seem to be you seem to be chatty patty today. That's good. Thank you very much for chatty patty. Victor? Uh, anything or you or your wife anything to say and was there anyone else there was some there was some other sneaky guy in here 
No, it's just you. It's you guys. It's Anna and Victor and Mark. By the way, guys, again, thank you very much for... It's funny to have... It's really funny. It's. I'm just going to drink here. It's funny. It's it's a blessing. It's also surprising. It's it's everything all at once. That a channel my size, with okay, there's some channels my size that have live streams with loads of people. That, but they they're doing stuff like politics and they're covering world events and they have better personalities, whatever. They know what they're doing. But a channel like mine that maybe is, in some ways, a little bit more eclectic in how it does the live streams. Where it, I don't know. Maybe that's not the right word to say for it. But it's very nice to be able to look. To come to a live stream and be like, oh, it's Mark, you know, that's Victor. Um, and then last time, uh, actually, a buddy I know in real life came on, and evidently he he stream snipes these things all the time, uh, listens to me talk in the background while he's probably playing video games, something like that. So it's actually really cool. Uh, by the way, I will be starting this week or next week, I'm going to be starting a Japanese language um, podcast or some, not podcast, a YouTube channel. It's going to be completely different, not going to be camera, not be about anything like that. It's going to actually be about the connection of man to the land. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. I'm a newbie at all this stuff, so whatever. And obviously, if, if you don't speak Japanese, no reason to come. Uh, but I will probably start linking that here and there in some of my videos or live streams, something like that. Um, as for reviews, at the moment, like I said before, it's a little bit, it's very difficult for me to organize them and get them published, get them edited. Right at the moment, I am doing the daddy daycare thing. Uh, that means all the cooking. <laughs> I'm I'm the wife. Uh, all the cooking, all the cleaning, taking care of the kid. Uh, I do my translation business on the side, but it's you know nothing is full time at the moment except for taking care of my daughter. Uh, and it is is tough to do other stuff. When my wife comes home, <laughs> I want to be with my family, so she's like, "You can do live stream." once or twice a week um and that's great uh but it is very hard it is very hard back when i was doing a lot of reviews uh i was i was at home i was doing work and then in the middle of work i could do something like that very easily but it's not easy now for me to get in front of a microphone even in here close my door it's loud um if my daughter's sleeping it's loud there's no way there's i'd be talking like this all right guys so uh, so now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be moving that over to the other side and then we're gonna and it's just not gonna work i don't want to do asmr as a joke sometimes i do want to do asmr but i don't really want to get into that sort of thing um and i don't want to be seen as the guy who cannot use his voice or cannot project his voice and i do have a problem with that i've been told that i have a semi deep voice but it sounds like i'm trying to swallow it so that no one hears it <laughs> i don't know how that, how that works but anyway that's it so mark victor anna uh do i have anyone else here and anyone else who's sitting out there who's striping this thing, striping, sniping this thing, thank you very much for watching. I will see you, depends on how things go, either later this week with another chat, another video like this, another live stream like this, or next week with something that I haven't thought about yet. But I will, like I said, I've got a new channel coming up that I don't have to do any editing on. This is very short. It's going to be in Japanese. It's about the connection of the man to the land. There's not a lot to think about, not a lot of editing, and that's why I can actually do that over top of the other things I'm trying to do. Thank you very much, Victor, Mark, Anna. See you guys later. I'm going to leave you off with the uh, live stream uh, video that some people hate that I need to change. Uh, let's see here. Turn this on here. I think I got it. How do you do this? Whoa, 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 whoa. Go over here. I just add share screen, Chrome tab. Oh, I love being a, it's good to be a, such a professional here. There we are. Oh wait, I didn't share the live. I didn't share the audio. All right, you're going out. The stream is going out without any audio. <laughs> I don't think it is at least. So uh, I'll just shut myself off. I'm just gonna, just gonna make this less awkward. All right, see you guys. Thank you very much.